Many people worry what you post online stays there forever. But what happens when the opposite is true? In an effort to protect viewers from violent videos, YouTube has been deleting clips and channels showing atrocities in Syria. In some cases, those videos may have been the only evidence out there of war crimes. From indiscriminate barrel bombs to chemical weapons attacks, YouTube has become an unintended hub of evidence, and some of the original uploaders have since been killed. YouTube admits the company may have made mistakes and says it has now reinstated some videos, but there's no guarantee that all clips can be retrieved and the years of research in tagging and organizing the footage is gone forever. Activists worry without this video proof, crimes may go unpunished. Well, my guest today has been leading an effort to organize video evidence of crimes in Syria from Amsterdam. I'm joined by Elliot Higgins. He's the founder of open source investigation website Bellingcat. He's also a research associate at King's College London and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Elliot, good to have you on the program. So it's you versus YouTube at the moment. Have you won given that they've reinstated these videos? Is it, is it all okay now? Well, um, I, I think really this is um, an unfortunate side effect of their attempts to deal with jihadi and ISIS uh, propaganda rather than any kind of battle between myself and YouTube. But it does raise some very important issues. Uh, YouTube is being used now um, by a lot of groups in Syria to document war crimes uh, and atrocities. And there's other groups that are using these inf this information to put together cases um, such as Bellingcat. And we found in the last few weeks that more and more of these accounts are being shut down. And this is a pretty major problem for those of us trying to track um, what's happening in the conflict. But do you have complete understanding of the context? I mean, do you have sympathy uh, with them, given that, for example, just a few years ago, circa 2014, it was very normal to stumble upon these this kind of atrocity porn or even daesh videos i remember on twitter and elsewhere things like the james foley beheading were just appearing on people's feed so do you understand that they're trying to legitimately tackle a real problem but you guys are perhaps unfortunate collateral damage sometimes as the algorithms and ai can't really distinguish between the two Yes, and I, I think um, really the James Foley execution was a watershed moment where um, people started taking these videos a lot more seriously and it probably led to what we're seeing um, today. But unfortunately, um, there's a lot of um, people kind of being caught in the crossfire. We've seen uh, one big issue is they're applying this, these new rules and this new algorithm to videos that were uploaded three or four years ago. And in the case of many Syrian opposition groups and people documenting this uh, crisis, they've uploaded thousands if not tens of thousands of videos since uh, that you know 2013 and 2012 and you just need a few strikes for your entire account to be gone and all those videos to dis disappear so I, I think in this attempt to control this jihadi content they've kind of overlooked a few um, issues uh, such as that as you know mm -hmm. retroactively punishing people for videos that were uploaded years ago yeah I want to move away a little bit from YouTube per se and the mistakes they have made to talk more generally about your work and you have done some tremendous work, whether it was uh, in terms of MH17, the failed coup here, the Khan Sheikhoun chemical attack. A lot of people go to your site. A lot of people have, have learned the value of open source information that they, you don't have to conduct these mega investigations or you don't have to rely on, on people conducting secret investigations. It's all out there, it's just how you compile it, right? And they go to people like you. Tell me how important this is to be used as evidence of war crimes. I mean, I see you're in The Hague. Is that why you're there right now? Are you, are you making some sort of case in terms of Syria? Uh, well, at the moment, I'm going to be uh, visiting the International Criminal Court to um, show them some of the work Bellingcat's done using open source information. They've actually been very proactive about looking into this area. And at the start of this month, they actually put an, uh, an arrest warrant for a uh, Libyan uh, commander who featured in several execution videos posted on social media. And that's very significant because this is one of the first examples of social media posts being used uh, by the International Criminal Court to draw up these arrest warrants. So already we're seeing a demonstration of how this is being used. Um, really, we've seen in the last uh, probably even just a couple of years, international organizations interested in justice and accountability, like the ICC, using open source information, social media posts, to start informing their work. And I think moving forward, we're only going to see more and more of that happening. A lot of people cited Bellingcat when it came to MH17. We saw RT and the likes pushing back, questioning a lot of your research and work. Power systems, governments don't just roll over and die if they have a competing narrative. Tell me how much pressure you've come across 
or you've faced because of the work you've done? Well, um, in the case of Russia, I mean, we've been targeted by um, the same hackers who um, targeted the DNC and resulted in the Podesta email leaks. Uh, we've been criticized by the uh, Russian Ministry of Defense and Russian Foreign Ministry. Uh, in fact, when the Russian Foreign Ministry attacked our work, I emailed them and asked them to explain what evidence they have. And they sent us um, what were plagiarized blog posts. They stole some stuff offline and sent it to us as their evidence. So, um, you know, their criticism really doesn't have much to uh, any legs to stand on. Um, you know, but we've faced criticism by Russian media organizations. Uh, you know, we get targeted in various ways. Uh, people have tried to access our emails because of the work we've been doing. So we do come under um, pressure from um, the Russian government in particular because of the work we're doing. And as we bring this back to the beginning, is it possible to balance those needs between protecting the public from coming across egregious stuff like the beheading of people or children and so on that's usually posted by bad groups like Daesh and stuff that is legitimately needed out there to document atrocities by belligerents in a conflict. Can those be balanced by social media and by video outlets such as YouTube? I think there's a possibility that can be done. It does require YouTube and other social media organizations to speak to groups who are working on this kind of content. And they have been, um, to be fair, some of these organizations have been doing this. But there is this kind of um, gray area. It's, it's like the Libyan execution videos. Those videos were posted on um, Facebook. Now, if those videos had been deleted immediately, people wouldn't have found them and they wouldn't be used in this ICC um, case. So um, it's kind of navigating that gray area. And also the area of um, archiving these videos. There are organizations such as the Syrian Archive who are trying to archive these videos, but they're only able to do a fraction of videos. And what might seem relevant now might not be relevant in 15 to 20 years' time to a case that might come up. And we're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of videos uploaded from the Syrian conflict. And we need to think seriously about how we can preserve that as evidence of war crimes. Elliot Higgins, great to talk to you. All the best with your work. Thanks so much for joining us.